Colin, is uh, people come up to me quite often and ask me about the city of Washington and say, what's it like playing way out on the West Coast? <laughs> so it, it isn't just you. You're not alone in that conversation. Okay, I want first I want to start. You are tired. Uh, people forget this. You Didn't you You either punt it or return punts? I returned punts. You were a hell of an athlete. Actually, I did punt once also. Okay. I punted against the Bears, and I have a, a one-yard average. Okay. <laughs> not that I'm it. proud of it, but that's <laughs> basically what happened. And you were an athlete. You went to Notre Dame. You returned punts. You were a quarterback. You wore that single bar. So you retired about 36. I retired at 35. 35. I what? was retired at 35. What do you make of Brady at 40? What do you make of it? Marvel at it. I just marvel at what Tom has been able to do. Of course, going back all those years, it's interesting. We didn't have the people around us like Tom has from a nutritional standpoint, physical therapy, and all the, all the treatments and all the things that he does to be able to keep himself fit, to be able to do right. what he does. Um, you know, our guys, I go back, when I started with the Redskins, our weight room was a universal gym. We took up a room about 10 by 10. That was about it. Today, they're 10,000 square feet. Yes. That used to be 1,000 before. A college weight room. Oh, they're gigantic nowadays. But the thing was, is I just, I marvel at what Tom's able to do. Um, but, but I'm not surprised because I've known him for so many years. The, the respect he has for the game, the love he has for the game, the passion he has. He's going to do everything he can to keep himself physically fit so that he can continue to go forward and do the things that he loves to do, and that's play football. Yeah, the, the efficiency and the consistency of Tom are remarkable. Um, you know, when you look at the way, and, and, and I hope it ends like it did for Jeter. It, he's a legend, it, it, yeah. but Michael Jordan played for the Wizards. Emmett Smith went for the Cardinals. It doesn't always end that way. I said that that's the way movies end, but in Hollywood, the reality with actors is nobody calls the last five years. Right, and, you know, Joe Montana in Kansas City. I mean, it, we could go on an endless list of people that have not done it, but, you know, I mean, New England is, uh, it's funny, in the beginning of the year, they never play well in the first game. Ever. That's just the way it is. September. But as the year goes on, you see Bill start to develop and do the things he wants, and one of the unsung heroes, I think, actually, Matt Patricia is one of the heroes in New England as well. We talk about Bill and Tom a lot, but Josh McDaniel's done a terrific job with a lot of different personnel yes. to move around as well. So, you know, it's a coaching staff that has really been together a long time. They understand that if we lose a piece, we need to find a piece, and how are we going to make it fit in? Okay, so Eli Manning, four years ago, his numbers were atrocious. I could have argued he was a shot fighter. They bring in OBJ, and he's a little bit of a Band-Aid on the wound. We, we start to think uh, Eli's reborn. But Eli doesn't have a great left tackle. He's not overly mobile. Listen, I believe John Mara, the Mara family, tipped us off a month ago. In the New York Post, there was a story, we're interested in the quarterback class collegiately. If Eli doesn't play, if you look at the draft board today, yep. Cleveland gets the number one pick. Mm -hmm. The front office for the Giants has determined there's two college quarterbacks we think can plug and play. I think they want Darnold at USC. Because of the wind, his escapability with the average line. And if they play Eli, they'll win a game. And if they play Geno, they won't. See, I, don't, I just don't buy into the fact that if you play somebody, they're going to win a game and it's going to reduce your position and ability to be able to draft a particular individual. That just isn't the mentality of coaches. And I don't believe it's the mentality of the front office of the Giants. I don't like what they've done to Eli. They basically have thrown Eli under the bus and saying, well, this is the classic line. We want to move forward and see what we have. Well, you don't have an offensive line, you don't have a wide receiving core, and you don't have a, a, a defense that really wants to step up and do anything. So that's what you do have. And what did Gino do in New York? You know, yeah, and, David, and David's a young guy. He has no idea what's going on out there. So, yes, the only thing that they bring to the table that Eli doesn't is the ability to run around and escape danger for a limited period of time. But I think Eli was, was done wrong. I don't think it's the right way to treat somebody who, by the way, in – Two nine and seven seasons went on to be the difference in the Giants winning two world championships. If it wasn't for him, trust me, they would have not won. He took the team on his shoulders, played terrifically through those games. And so from that perspective, at least give the guy some dignity. You talk about Tom going out in a dignified way and hopefully going out like Jeter has and, and Brett Favre and the guys that have you know, been at the top of the game like John Elway did right out on, okay. on, that, on that horse. Um, I just think it was wrong the way he was done. Okay, let's talk Dallas Cowboys Washington last night. Um, let's talk about Kirk Cousins. This is kind of fascinating to me. I always say not every business is Apple and Amazon. There's a lot of really good businesses. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of good quarterbacks that are franchise quarterbacks. They're not Aaron Rodgers. No. Is that I think Kirk Cousins, he's lost McVay. 
He's lost. Jordan Rizzo is hurt. He lost his two best receivers. Chris Thompson, a dynamic running back, is out. You know, he's still, last night, the exception, he's made them playoff viable. But in Washington, they say the last five games, it feels like the reports are that'll determine if he's a franchise guy. Do you believe no. they're still undecided? No, I do not at all. I believe that the decision has been made to want to keep him. And keep in mind, on May 2nd, the Redskins offered Kirk a deal. May 2nd of this year. They offered him a deal. He chose to decline the offer because he wanted to pursue other options, possibly at the end of this season. He knew he was going to make $24 million in a franchise guarantee. Right. So why not take the chance and roll the dice? What I've been amazed at is his consistency under a circumstance where so many things are changing around him. They'll, they'll have 23 different offensive line combinations that'll start this next week coming up in wow. 10 days. 23. The wide receiving core has been absolutely non-existent. You talk about Jordan Reed. I think Vernon Davis has done a terrific job yes. stepping in. But what really gets lost, again, in this, is you have to look at some of the coaches sometimes. The job that Jay Gruden has done, most offensive coordinators have six, five, five or six people to work with. Jay has three. And he doesn't really have an offensive line because you don't really have wide receivers that can go threaten anywhere. Josh Doxson's finally stepping up a little bit nice. and making a presence, a but he, he's miss. still young. It is a little hit and miss. So you look at try and try and craft, first of all, as a head coach, put enough players on the field to be competitive. Then craft an offense that can at least generate you some opportunities. But, you, you know, you can't fumble three times and throw two interceptions in a football game. And like I say, sometimes interceptions get blamed on quarterbacks. You know, I'd like to see an assist go to somebody else and yeah. say it wasn't all mine. It was yeah. somebody else at times. Right. But Kirk's been unbelievable. But he's going to have a lot of opportunities. He'll get $120, $130 million. Question is, where does he want to be? Do you think he wants to be in Washington? I do believe he okay. does. We've right. had conversations, and I, I really believe he does. And, and you know, playing under this franchise tag, it it's not, doesn't change the way he is as a person. He's wonderfully consistent as an individual. Faith-based, bottom line, head Great down. Great kid. Terrific kid. And student of the game and loves to learn and loves to compete. And you see it in, in the way he's running around all over the place, making plays with his legs. That's where his game has changed this year. Okay, our, our, here in Los Angeles, we're kind of shocked. So Sean McVay's in <laughs> Washington. You know him. Yep. He's like, he's like this, uh, they used to call him Man Genius, Eric Man Genius. So he comes out here. And the Rams are a dumpster fire offensively. Mm -hmm. And now Goff's amazing. And Sammy Watkins is open. And Robert Woods and Cooper Cup and Todd Gurley. Are you shocked? Because we in Los Angeles, Joe, the Rams weren't bad last year. They were unwatchable. We argued they had the third best offense in town after USC and UCLA. Right. Are you shocked by how good they are offensively? Not really when I look at the talent. First of all, last year, Todd Gurley wasn't healthy. And I think that's a big thing for what they want to do. Any offensive coordinator wants to have the ability to be able to use the running game. You take a look at, go, I'll regress one second, the Redskin-Cowboy game last night. The difference in that game was the fact that the Cowboys were able to gain eight, nine yards on first and ten. And their offensive line took control of the game. With the Rams, Sean McVay is a, a wonderfully creative, intense Terrific young man. He gave me the privilege to be able to sit in the, in the installation meetings during training camp. I listened to him present. And as a matter of fact, when he got the job out here, I basically said, they asked me about Jared Goff. What do you think? I said, if Jared Goff listens to Sean McVay and applies himself, because he's going to challenge him, he's got a chance to be really special. Now, I think it's early in his career to say, you know, what it's going to be. Same thing with Carson Wentz. You know, they're playing well. They're doing really good things. They're still young in their careers. But Sean has brought an ability to be able to communicate with a whole bunch of guys. He's so much more, and I don't like to use the term mature as much as I do, experienced in the game of football than a lot of people are. Plus, he's an offensive coach. Jeff Fisher was a defensive coach. Game, teams look differently when you have an offensive head coach and a defensive head coach. Unless somebody just steps aside and says, you guys go do it. One other thing about the Los Angeles Rams. Again, another individual on the coaching staff who nobody talks about, the hiring of Wade Phillips. You can go get all the free agents you want, but when you bring someone in like Wade to run your defense where you don't have to worry about it, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go put a game plan in. I'm going to go be the head coach of the football team. You take care of the defense. That's a great and gift. That's exact, and that's exactly what he has. So the staff is extremely solid. Let me talk about Dak Prescott last night. Um, I, I went back.